My assignment is to make sure you never remain at the same level. My assignment is to make sure that the devil has no place and no part in your destiny. My assignment is to make sure that you enjoy the victory that is in Christ in experience. My assignment is that you find meaning and purpose and joy as you live for Jesus and as you serve him in experience. My assignment is that you transit from being a believer to a witness. As a believer alone, you will not be able to do much for the kingdom. But until you become a witness, that transition from a believer to a witness, the assignment, the mandate is given not just to believers but to witnesses. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we were given a mandate by Jesus himself that after we receive power, we have the mandate to be witnesses, validators of his life, validators of his claims, validators of his power in all its ramifications. So we are raising witnesses and um, ambassadors of the kingdom, light, salt, men and women who understand God, who understand the ways of God and are empowered by light and grace to represent his purposes across the globe. If you are part of that glorious army, shout a believing amen. amen. All right. Tonight's teaching is quite an interesting one. God is going to be challenging and speaking to us. I want to show you tonight by the Spirit of God, the kind of person who will have encounters, encounters that transform. I want to teach you how to draw virtue from heaven to be empowered even by the Spirit. Hallelujah. The title of my teaching tonight is Who Touched Me? Who Touched Me? Luke chapter 8 from verse 41 to 48. We're discussing destiny defining encounters, encounters that transform. Follow carefully as we draw light and wisdom from this scripture. And behold, there came a man named Jarius. And the Bible says he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one only daughter above 12 years of age. And she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman, part of the story now, a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. She came behind him and touched the border or the helm of his garment and immediately the issue of blood stanched. It stopped, ended. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody had touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him, before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately 48 final verse now and he said unto her daughter be of good comfort thy faith had made thee whole final instruction go in peace give us wisdom and understanding in the name of jesus christ so the bible tells us that the things that are written aforetime he says they are for our learning so that we through patience and the comfort of scripture might find hope. Everything that is written, the Bible says, aforetime, inspired by the spirit, that it was written, captured, documented so that the saints can learn God. The saints can learn the ways of God. They can learn the principles of the kingdom hidden through stories hidden through parables, hidden through events, hidden through the lives of people, are principles of the kingdom 
that can help the saints to know God, to understand his ways. Are we together? To draw light from those stories and then to walk in victory. And this is one of such profound renditions. So we'll see what we can draw from this tonight as it concerns having encounters and as it prepares us to become great vessels even for the use of the master. Number one, men can touch God. Men can touch God in a way that radically changes the course of their destinies for good. This is the first thing I want you to know. Men, as mortal, as frail as we are, the Bible shows us from this story among others that men can touch God and touch him in a way that radically changes the course of their destinies for good. Hallelujah. Ordinary men, weak men, frail men, sometimes uneducated men, sometimes men who have come from dangerous backgrounds. The Bible says men can touch God and that men can touch God in a way that can radically transform their lives, transform their ministries, transform their destinies. A man can have a destiny defining encounter. A man can have a life altering encounter when he touches God. Whether you look at Abraham in the Bible or Isaac or Jacob or Moses or Isaiah or Gideon or David or Solomon or the apostles that were mentored directly by Jesus or blind Bartimaeus, one of these men who made up his mind thou son of David have mercy upon me the Bible says they shot the man and said don't disturb Jesus Jesus was passing Jericho for the last and final time and the Bible says the man refused to keep quiet he shouted and he touched Jesus so much Jesus stopped and he attended to blind Bartimaeus, and that was where he received his sight how about Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And even though a controversial Pharisee, he began to engage Jesus in an intelligent discussion. And Jesus, seeing the purity of his motif, began to respond to him. And it was that discussion between two of them that eventually led to John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world. It was not a sermon he was giving in a synagogue. It began as a discussion between Jesus and a man whose heart was determined to touch God. How about Paul the Apostle? A Pharisee of Pharisees received a mandate to go and destroy the program of God. And on his way to Damascus, a light came upon him and that radically transformed him. Hallelujah. So the Bible is full of men and women who touched God in various regards. And for every one of these names aforementioned, the Bible tells us and leaves us with this note that their lives were not the same. Abraham was changed to Abraham. Remember? Isaac, Jacob changed to Israel. Moses became not just one who was to be a prince in Egypt, but became a prophet and a deliverer. Isaiah in chapter 6, when he encountered God, he was mandated and empowered again, even though a genuine prophet, to now represent the purposes of God. Weak Gideon, least in his father's house, least of the tribes, became a mighty warrior. David, the man after God's heart. No one else in the Bible had that title. How about Solomon? encountered the wisdom of God and his life changed, became one of the wisest kings. The apostles, fruits of Jesus' own apostleship, as weak and frail as they were, most of them became mighty men, including Thomas and Peter. And then of course you know Paul, later became the mighty apostle who wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament as recorded. Now, I want you to pay attention, please. We have established the fact that men can touch God, that as mighty, invisible, and in many instances, mysterious as God is, it is possible that men can touch him. But just 
to bring us to speed with our understanding. What does it mean to touch? What does it mean to touch God? I don't want to assume that we understand that. So I decided to write a, a, a thing or two about that expression, that word touch. To touch means to come in contact with. First definition. To touch means to come in contact with. Number two. To touch means to connect to. Let me repeat myself again so you can write. To touch means to come in contact with. Secondly, to touch means to connect to. The third definition is very beautiful. To touch means to produce feelings of affection and empathy. To produce feelings of affection and empathy. One last time. To touch means to come in contact with. Proximity enough to make contact. Number two. To touch means to connect to. Finally, to touch means to produce in the individual feelings of affection and empathy. And I want us to walk with the third definition as we explore this subject. So when the Bible talks about touching or touching Jesus, it is an attempt to describe something a man can do that can produce within him, being a man, the feelings of affection and sympathy and empathy are we together men can touch God and touch him in a way that radically alters their life the cause of their destinies for good the second point I want you to know tonight is that from this story the multitudes had access and they had proximity they even touched Jesus they made contact with him without any evident transformation please give us that scripture luke chapter 8 now verse 45 i believe the multitudes now watch this and jesus said who touched me when they denied peter and all they that were with him said master the multitudes can you give us new king james so that we just escape some of these words these old english expressions Oh dear, can we find another version? NIV, let's try it. For the purpose of our explanation, NIV, beautiful. Okay, now he says, who touched me? Jesus asked, and when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Beautiful expressions. Crowding and pressing against you. You would think because there were many and they were touching Jesus, something would happen to them absolutely nothing was happening to them now when you want to touch a man the first thing you need is proximity to that man am i right and when you get there you reach either by speaking by stretching your hands and all the people were doing exactly that yet it did not touch jesus the multitudes had access the multitudes had proximity they even make contact with jesus not the fake jesus the real Jesus and yet there was no evident transformation in their lives my goodness so you can do correct activities physical contact with Jesus religiosity and correct activities does not equal having an encounter that produces transformation from a physical standpoint everything the people did was right that is exactly what it takes to touch a man Yet there was no evident transformation and Jesus did not even bear record that they were touching him. The multitudes had access. There are many people today who have access to church. They have access to the ministry of prayer. They have access to Bibles. They have access to teachings. Watch this now. There are many people who have access to fasting programs. There are many people who have access to powerful worship. There are many people who have access to apostolic teaching, pastoral, evangelical, prophetic platforms. That is like having proximity, coming so close and even reaching. How many tapes do we have in our homes? 
How many books do we have in our homes written by great men, veterans of the gospel? Hallelujah. How many Bibles do we have? Concordances, all kinds of commentaries and references. The Bible in its variety, not to talk of e-versions that can afford you hundreds of different versions. But there are many believers with this increasing spiritual activity, the corresponding evident transformation that attests to the fact that you are meeting the God of the Bible is missing and absent in many lives. Who touched me? How do you single a person in the midst of a crowd? Who? One person touched me in the midst of a crowd. Just because multitudes are coming to church does not mean they are touching him. Just because many are involved in ministry does not mean they are touching him. Just because many are involved in spirituality in all its ramifications. Listen, if you were to mark those multitudes and those crowds, I hope you know the same thing they did was the same thing the man who was crippled did. And Jesus called what that man did faith. They tore the roof and tried to reach Jesus and the man was healed. But in this instance, the crowd were pressing. More so, they, I believe they were talking or saying something. And yet, in the mind of Jesus, nobody was really making any profitable contact with him. Could this be why many times we pray sincerely and the power that should follow prayer does not speak in our lives? Could it be that this may be why sometimes we study scripture? Sincerely so. But the light, the illumination and the wisdom that should proceed from contact with the word is not evident in our lives. The Bible says ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Could this be why we fast? Could this be why we attend church sincerely but the corresponding transformation, are we together now, that attests to the fact because you see, for Jesus to say who touched me like you will be learning, there are evidences, something happened to him. This one, he was not given a word of knowledge. Something happened to him, spiritually and physically. He felt it as an evidence that he was touched. The multitudes had access. Many multitudes today have access. Access to teachings. Access to men of God. Access to spiritual resources. Access to spiritual activities genuine spiritual activities but the activities in themselves do not guarantee evident transformation now there are clear write this down please there are clear unmistakable evidences when men touch god there are clear unmistakable evidences when men touch god and I'm going to run through a little list with you right now so that you will know clearly whether your spiritual activity as sincere as it is is really touching God and delivering to you that which is supposed to deliver or there may be a need to redirect your approach spiritually. Are we together? There are clear, unmistakable evidences when men touch God. Evidence number one. How do you know that a man, a church, a ministry, a man of God, a family, an individual, how do you know that a man has truly touched God? How do you know that God has become endeared to a man by reason of his press? One, the first proof that a man has really touched God is reverence and honor for God. The first proof that a man has made contact with the God of the Bible. Many years ago, I preached a profound message called the evidence of genuine intimacy with God. And the first point I gave in that teaching is a revelation of the true state of your heart. You know you have met the God of the Bible because your heart will be opened before you like an x-ray. Are we together now? The first evidence that you have met God is not power. The first evidence that you have met God is not elevation. The first evidence that you have met God, according to Isaiah chapter 6, 
is a revelation of the true state of your heart leading to reverence and honor do you believe that hmm. verse 47 same Luke 8 here I am in your presence do to me what you want I'm open before you, Lord. Do to me what you want. Give it to us, please. Luke 8, 47. Watch this. And the woman saw, when Jesus said, who touched me? Everybody was denying. And the woman knowing, look what has happened to her. The first thing that happened to her was she knew that I cannot lie in his presence. I've been touched. Something left him into me. And if it is true that the person who touched me is grace and truth personified, then that effect must happen in me. And the Bible says, when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, not fear, reverence, and falling down before him. Does that look like what the 20 and 4 elders do? And she declared unto him before all the people what was the cause, the reason why she touched him and how she was healed immediately. Let me tell you the truth. When men touch God, it alters something about the state of their heart. It is impossible to meet the God of the Bible and remain the same. The version that met God is never the version that leaves his presence. If you meet God and that same version left, you met a demon spirit. I assure you, if it is the God of the Bible, no matter how stubborn you are, something will happen when you see God in his glory. You can choose to live in denial and ignore him. But one thing is that your life will never be the same. Are we together? When Abraham had an encounter with the God of the Bible, something happened to him. When Jacob had an encounter with the God of the Bible, his name was, was changed from Jacob, a cheat and a supplanter into Israel. The promise. For thou what is your name? And he said, I am Jacob. He said, thou shalt no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God and you have prevailed. Touched the whole of his tie, blessed him, changed his name to Israel. The son arose there and he called it Peniel, the face of God. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. How about Isaiah in chapter 6? Isaiah was a great prophet, mighty prophet, anointed prophet. Isaiah was not a fake prophet. He was a genuine prophet. The book of Isaiah begins with prophecy. And in chapter 6, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, verse 1, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord when he saw him high and lifted up. The Bible says the train of his robe filled the temple. When Isaiah saw the Lord, nobody told him anything by himself he said whoa i am undone i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell amidst the people of unclean lips that is not condemnation that is the convicting power of the presence of god and god didn't say you are being too harsh on yourself he said who shall we send and in fact one of the seraphs the bible says took a live coal not a cold one a live coal and touched his lips the instrument that he will use to prophesy to the nations and he said your iniquity this moment is taken away from you do you know if you had met Isaiah in chapter 1 to 5 and said dear prophet do you know that there is iniquity in your heart that man will probably crucify you and say you are stupid for status let me even prophesy to you but by the time he encountered God that was not an issue of fake or real you don't have to be fake to need the help of God. The purifying power of God is for all men. Isaiah encounters the God of the Bible. And from the eyes of God's mercy and fire, a seraph takes a live coal and touches him and says, your iniquity is taken away and your sins purged. Then verse 8, I heard a voice saying, who shall I send? And who shall go for us? Isaiah 
already a genuine prophet, preaching, prophesying. He now said, do you know what? Let's start ministry again. Here I am, send me. Isaiah would have been building branches called Koinonia. Isaiah would have been holding great conferences. And yet, while he was doing all of that, heaven was still saying, who shall we send? Can I tell you the truth? If you encounter the God of the Bible, you will love his presence more than ministry. You will love his presence more than reputation. You will love his presence more than title. Trying to give a good name and a good, those things would die immediately. The prophet said, woe, I am undone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. You never encounter the God of the Bible and the spirit of reverence and honor for him does not come upon you. If you meet God, the God of the Bible, and the only thing you walk out with is revelation, something is questionable about your encounter. The first thing that happens when men meet God is they die to themselves. They die to their ambitions. They die. There is a level of brokenness. 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 I think that should be Psalm 51 and verse 17. Did I get that right? Let's try it. Psalm 51. Yes. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Is that in your Bible? A broken and a contrite heart. Oh God! Any man, any man that encounters the God of the Bible, any man that touches God from what flows from him to you, you cannot remain the same. Here I am in your presence. Do to me what you want. I'm open before you, Lord. Do to me what you want. Here I am in your presence. Do to me what you want I'm open before you Lord this is a very powerful prayer in fact that, that's the part I want you to say again do to me what you want it's it's a it's a prayer it's a surrender do to me what you want Forget that I'm a man of God. I come as your child. Take away apostle and prophet. Take away whatever it is. Those titles can be interruptions to your having an encounter. I am Geo. I am president. When you come before God, you take away your golden crowns and cry before your maker. Search my heart. Try my thoughts. If there be any wicked way in me, lead me to the way of everlasting. Let me tell you the truth when God stretches his hands and allows you to touch him the first thing that happens to you is that everything that is not him becomes threatened in your life immediately everything that is not him everything it dies a, a war a real warfare begins from within you you see you will never know how many luggages are there interrupting your flight in the spirit until he touches you. When something flows from the God of the Bible to you, it's impossible to sleep and be at peace. No. You will find out that you don't even want to be among a crowd again. You will walk alone like a madman. It's a season of... Con there, there is a pruning. At that point, you will not think of your titles again. At that point, you will not think of your accolades again. It is the reason why we fast, yet we don't receive anything. Because we don't use them as vehicles to touch him. We use them as vehicles to create pride and accolades. It's the reason why we pray, and as sincere as it is, we don't touch him. It's the reason why we read sincerely and quote scripture, yet the corresponding evident transformation does not follow. Who touched me? There are evidences that follow men. When God reaches down to touch you, it is because like the seraphs, 
He wants to roll away that iniquity. He wants to roll away that sin from your life and bring you to a point where you are purified like gold. Purified like gold. Purified like gold. Is somebody learning tonight? Purified like gold. Let me tell you the truth. Your service is useless until the state of your heart is pure. Your service to God is useless until the state of your heart is pure. Your service will do not much to if you it doesn't matter how effective the service is until God finds a genuine vessel, your service will be wanting. Number two, very quickly, there are clear, unmistakable evidences when men meet God. One is a revelation of the true state of your heart that leads to reverence and honor. Number two, superior proof producing wisdom. The second evidence, when men touch God, among the many things we have to see in their life, is superior comma, proof producing wisdom. Because there are different levels of wisdom. There is wisdom, earthly wisdom, that just puffs up and does not produce results. Superior proof producing wisdom. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. I want us to shout this scripture together. Because the fear of the Lord leads you somewhere. It's like a vehicle. Are you ready? One to read. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So any wisdom that was not derived from the fear of the Lord is corrupted wisdom and it will destroy you. Are we together? That according to scripture, wisdom proceeds is like a river. It is the fear of the Lord that brings a man into correct wisdom because from the fruits of that wisdom, your heart will not be deceived by them because it was the fear of the Lord that led you to that place. When you try to access wisdom outside of the fear of the Lord, it will lead to pride, self-righteousness, and eventually self-destruction. The correct pathway is that it starts with the fear of the Lord. Yirat Adonai. The fear of the Lord. Superior proof-producing wisdom. How do you know a man who has touched God? You will see wisdom beyond your age. Wisdom beyond your level of education. Wisdom at a frequency, at a dimension. You don't have to be born again to see and know that this one is divine wisdom. Even as an unbeliever, you see the outworkings, the quality of the decisions, the fruits of wisdom evident in the life of such a person. You will know that that person has touched God. Number three. What is the third proof that a man has touched God? liberty hallelujah liberty liberty give us verse 43 of luke 8 and then we jump to 48 liberty how do i know i have touched god liberty my god and the woman the bible says she had an issue of blood how many years 12 years she was not a careless woman she made medical efforts to a point that she spent all her living she was a wise woman she had a savings account but that situation depleted her until everything went away she was sick she needed healing verse 48 and he said unto her daughter be of good comfort your faith has made you help me it never said your faith has healed you it gave her beyond healing liberty now the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty liberty healing restoration matthew chapter 11 28 to 30 matthew chapter 11 as i'm speaking right now i know that the spirit of liberty is hovering around this place that there are people who have been here you've tried medicine just like this our dear woman You've tried everything as it is. That diagnosis right now, if God does not help you, it may take your life or take your family. There are people who are not sick, but the trouble on your head is, bet is better to be on admission in the hospital than to carry the kind of trouble that is on your head now. There are people who would prefer to be on admission. Come unto me, all ye that labor, 
and a heavy leaden. Read with me, Koinonia. And I will give you rest. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lonely in heart. And ye shall find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I tell you sincerely, many of you, what you are carrying on your head is a demon that put it there. It's not God. The devil is just deceiving you that is God. That is just what is a lie. He said, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. The burden that is about to kill you is not of God. It is the devil. He has added his load gently and quietly on your head. It's time for that load to go down. I speak to you in the name of Jesus. Every tree that my father has not planted around your life that is stopping the purposes of God from finding expression. The Lord brought you to church tonight so that you will be free. I administer liberty upon you by the Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. How do you know you have touched God? You will look for what caused you pain what is making you spend your money without profit? For that woman, it was the issue of blood. You may not have the issue of blood, you may, but you may. The thing that is common between her and every other person pressing Jesus is that they had issues. The issues had name. For someone, issue of blood. For you, it may be issue of finances. For another person, it may be issue of whatever. Liberty. You know that men have touched God because they walk away free. They go to him in chains, but they walk away free. The woman, after 12 years, she touched the hem of his garment and immediately that satanic, demonic issue of blood stopped. How about the woman who was bent for 18 years? Woman, you are loose from your infirmity and that moment, that demonic satanic thing left listen to me don't waste his presence every time God shows up imagine a loving father stretching his hands and saying you have gone through enough don't don't allow this continue I'm reaching out to you I know you are here precious Holy Spirit I know you are here, precious Holy Spirit, I know you are here, you're here to bring revival, I know you are here, precious Holy Spirit, hallelujah, listen, I've experienced the liberating power that encounters bring many of you do not know that when you meet God you are supposed to be free most people don't know they know they are supposed to not be the way that they came as at the time that they were before they met him but for most people they do not know that freedom and liberty is one of the benefits the proof that you have met him that woman made up her mind and said I do not have access to him I'm not part of his inner circle like I shared with you last week it is not in his schedule to touch me but a combination of holy anger and hunger pushed that woman and everybody was touching whatever they would touch she touched him sincerely he touched me Jesus touched me and oh, what joy filled my heart. Hear the song. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. How do you know that that touch has happened? Because a destiny helper that has no business calling you suddenly calls you and said, I had a dream yesterday night, never knowing that you were praying through the night and say, God, is this how my life will continue? Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, 
God can touch men, but men can touch God. I'm not telling you what happens when God touches men. I'm telling you what happens when men reach. If that woman was waiting for Jesus to touch her, she would have waited there forever. The most important thing is that there should be a contact. Something happened now. I know he touched me. Favor happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Healing happened. Now I know he touched me. Listen, how do you know someone has entered your house without a word of knowledge? You will see that something has shifted from the normal arrangement of things. You can enter your kitchen and say, no, something has happened. Somebody has come into this place. And then someone may come behind and say, I came and you were not there. Presence creates effect. If it is true that you have touched him, your finances should not remain the same. Your dreams should not remain the same. The demons cannot come in and go out as no. No. The spirits cannot disrespect that encounter and act as if it's not God that you met. Now, I know he touched me. And there is nothing you can't do. I sense an anointing here, my God. Oh Lord, my eyes are on you. Be magnified. Oh Lord, be I want to use this song that ministers to someone. I don't know who you are. But it's in my spirit to just speak this before we continue. I have made you too small in my eyes. Oh Lord. You have said God is not able to do it. Forgive me. Listen. And I have believed in a lie. All kinds of lies. That you were unable to help me. But now, oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my heart and with my soul, oh Lord, be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Please be seated. Liberty. When men touch God, everything that is not by God, from God, has to give way. When men touch God, I want you as you are seated here I know that the Spirit of God is moving but you just imagine that you are that woman with the issue of blood and imagine that Galilean full of strange power passing you are already declared unclean so you don't have access to come into the city to touch him but since you could not reach him he has come this close don't waste that opportunity through pride the woman reached and she touched him. A man of can touch God and his grace can rest on your ministry. It becomes evident that you have touched God. Your preaching will change 
not by the sounds <laughs> but the life that is transmuted through your speakings while you are seated just whisper it oh lord Emmanuel. oh lord Be magnified in my finances. Be magnified in my ministry. Be magnified in my destiny. Be magnified in my home. Oh. So I'm chasing after you. No matter what I have to do. I need. your heart. Lord, I'm chasing after you. No matter what I have to do, I need you more and more. More and more. More and more. who are willing to look beyond the crowd look beyond their pain losing blood is losing life that woman was already weak she had every excuse to sit down there and say a compassionate Jesus should come to me what she said if I may but touch she said to herself I don't have the power to heal myself but I can reach. I can come to God and say, my financial situation is going to kill me if you don't help me. I can come to God and say, the husband that I have in my home right now, if you don't help me, is going to tear this marriage into pieces. You can come to God. Can I tell you? Don't wait till you are healed before you come to him. He's the only one who can heal. You come to him with that issue. You don't wait till you are healed, then you come to give thanks. He is the one you thank, but he is the one who heals you. Number four. What is the fourth evidence? The fourth unmistakable evidence that men, a man, including you, has touched God. Genuine power. The fourth evidence that you have touched God is that you receive from him an unction that transforms your life and then from you transforms the nations did you hear what I said genuine power you receive from him an unction that first transforms your life and then from you transforms the nations verse 46 same Luke chapter 8 let's hurry up and Jesus said, somebody had touched me, not by word of knowledge, for I perceive that virtue, glory, power, unction has gone out of me. My God, I perceive people were touching me. The reason why I know they did not touch me, even though they were making contact, was that nothing was leaving me to them. I came full and left full. Nobody placed a demand but a woman who never attended his services. A woman who never had the opportunity to sit under his teaching because of her situation. She reached out by faith and unction, glory, power left God. Do you know? I submit to you. I understand this thing that Jesus has said. This statement, I understand it. If you really walk in the anointing, you will understand what Jesus said. You can literally, you know how you draw a drink from a straw and watch that drink 
you put a straw into um, some container huh? and then you draw and you see it rising and it's reducing in the cup and entering your mouth that's what Jesus was saying you can feel unction leaving you not like it's killing you but it's like a deposit for the people you know when they are drawing it I've gone to meetings where way before I entered the auditorium you could sense a pool you could sense hunger you you know that the people came to receive there are times that you know that just a handful of people people were just there for the ceremony but the hunger to receive was not there I've prayed for people and sometimes sincerely of course I just believe by faith but you know that something that was supposed to come out from you did not come out to them and there are others sometimes you are passing you even have to turn and like Jesus said, who touched me? They did not make contact. But the, right from that distance, I never make contact one-on-one -on -one with Reinhard Bonke. But my God, ask God and ask him. Something left evidently from that crusade ground and landed on this head you are seeing. Who touched me does not mean who made physical contact with me. Who was hungry enough to discern what I carry you see you have to discern the bible says he that cometh unto god must believe that he is to discern how can god be passing and he passes my problem and acts like he did not see it it is very typical of god to act as if he did not see it blind Bartimeo cried this woman cried jarius the centurion cried don't keep quiet and just assume that after all he knows all things he knows my family problem the devil will tear your life into pieces you cry thou son of David if I can't touch you I can shout to your ears do you believe what you are hearing power there is no man that touches God and nothing leaves God and enters your spirit genuine authentic power power that produces results reminded of my experiences with him my god when his majesty reached into my room light at his brilliance this one it was not me that touched him oh maybe i touched him with hunger my encounter was purely a product of mercy but when he stretched that majestic hand towards me it's like connecting a man to high voltage electricity every part of you from head to toe resonating at the frequency of that power listen genuine power is not just by talking and making noise if you have an encounter with the god of the bible except you you met a demon power that transforms who touched me i sense that virtue has left me who touched me? Who placed a demand on the healing anointing? Who placed a demand on the spirit of wisdom? Who placed a demand on the grace for signs and wonders? Who placed a demand on the grace for influence? Who placed a demand on the hear ye him anointing? Who placed a demand for grace for wealth and abundance? Who placed a demand on the spirit of wisdom and revelation? He said, who touched me? You know that you have touched him because something leaves him to your spirit. Listen when solomon touched god in that encounter i hope you know it was a dream if you were solomon's roommate you would get up in the morning and say good morning sir not knowing the man that slept is not the same man that woke up something had come upon his life i hope you believe what you are hearing you want to take the nations for jesus you want to do mighty things for the kingdom ladies and gentlemen please hear me it is going to take beyond your zeal. There is an ability that only God has, is the ultimate custodian, but he can give it to men. My God. In ancient times, when you study classical Greek mythology, they believe that people, Zeus and Hermes, were Greek gods, and that they were part of these alien deities that came and met with the daughters of men. And so they gave birth to human beings that were half human beings and half extraterrestrials carrying, you know, they were not ordinary human beings. 
So when they saw Paul and Silas, they saw the mighty things they were doing. They said, no, you are not normal. You are a human being and something else. You are Zeus and Hermes. There is something God can do in a man that you will be as ordinary as you look. But the power that emanates from you, it will make people say, what is this? God for you. Who touched me? Who received power from me? I believe in the power of God. I will be wasting your time without the power of God. You will sympathize with people eternally without transformation if you don't have power. If the only thing you have is a salmon, you will propose things without the ability to make it happen. God can heal, nobody gets healed. God can lift, nobody gets healed. Receive God, no, nothing will happen. It takes power. How about wicked spirits that have vowed that they will not let your destiny go? Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy work, Psalm 63. Huh? It says, through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves. For as long as the lion has refused to roar, any animal can claim to be the king of the jungle. And while they are shouting it, the lion keeps quiet until it is hungry. When the lion is hungry, it comes with an attitude of no fear and roars across that jungle. Do you believe this? Let me tell you the truth. The church is not as weak as it looks. Believers are not as weak as they look. There is a momentum building in the spirit. It's not a momentum of pride, but it's building in the spirit. The church is gradually evolving, slowly but surely, to a place where there will be, it's, it's like a, a, a breaking point will soon be hit in the church and you will see manifestations of apostolic power like we have never seen before. I hope we have the grace to believe it when we see it because you will see raising the dead, it will happen like healing headache. You will see manifestations. Ordinary people. I believe this. I believe this. That someone will come and tell you, I'm about to be put in prison. Why? Because I'm owing 50 million naira. And, and I'm sincere. I've asked God for forgiveness. And you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your destiny help I help this man. And right in the presence of that man, somebody who has no business helping him will come and say, I was instructed by God. Go and find out how men like John Lake went to Spokane. Some of those people were led by God. They had no money, no nothing. And before they arrived, God had instructed men to wait. Was it not in your Bible that Elijah was living like a madman? If you were in Bible days, you would call Elijah irresponsible. Yet it was God that told him, carry nothing and be on your way. I've commanded a widow. And when he met the woman, she never sounded like she was commanded. Can I tell you the truth? There are people who God has already commanded. Many. They have been commanded to make sure you don't cry. Your assignment is to agree with God so that they will hear what he has said. Because he has spoken, but you must echo it. They hear twice. He's spoken once. It is your responsibility to make them hear the second time. I have spoken once, but you, are here to, you have heard twice. That power belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. For many of you, help has not arisen because you don't know the true function of power. The true function of power is not falling down and standing up. No. The true function of power is influencing changes in your life, compelling compliance, correcting anomalies. I'd like you to pray one prayer. I think it was Kenny or Isaac when he came up here. He prayed a prayer for grace. Once you are there, say, Father, multiply grace. Let your power rest upon my life. Tired of living a powerless Christian experience. Someone pray. Tired of powerless worship. Powerless preaching. Powerless teaching. Powerless business. Powerless entrepreneurship. Tired of powerlessness. By grace, by your spirit, let genuine spiritual power 
the power that transforms let virtue from the throne flow into this frail body this frail ministry this frail business this frail destiny Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Something is happening to you now. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. One more time. Let it flow, let it flow. Uh. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow right here, right now. Hallelujah. Please listen, my dear people. When men touch God, something happens to the state of their hearts producing genuine reverence and honor to God when men touch God they find as a fruit of that encounter superior proof producing wisdom when men touch God they find liberty liberty that is clear unmistakable when men touch God they access genuine power power to change their generation power to influence outcomes correct anomalies establish realities finally when men touch God they encounter peace verse 48 please sit down verse 48 of Luke chapter 4 Hi. God is speaking to someone speaking to someone I'm sensing this thing in my spirit God is speaking to someone you need to find peace you need to find peace listen there is rest in peace but there is go in peace rest in peace we use it for dead people but go in peace is for people who are alive but are almost dead because of the kinds of trouble when you say rest in peace generally is for someone who has died and you are just saying rest in peace hoping that the person died in Christ but Jesus did not tell a dead woman he told a woman who had a dead condition but she was alive his final charge to her was go in peace do you know why that statement was powerful if Jesus left that woman to go without speaking peace to her, she would still not be. In, she would still not. She would still have a lot of trouble because she was going to now go back to people who had not seen her for a long time. The controversy that will surround her arrival, the benefit of her healing will not even be evident because they will know her. They knew her yesterday as an unclean person suddenly she shows up and says he healed me was it verified medically are you stupid the trouble that will surround her life alone he needed to send her with peace peace when men encounter god john 14 27 jesus said peace i live with you are you seeing it believers you need to know what jesus left with us he did not just leave the holy spirit Holy Spirit truly but you left peace you ignored it thinking it's not important peace I live with you in this wicked world you need this oh you need this more than money my peace I give unto you not as the world giveth he says give I to you let not your heart be troubled this is what will happen to you when you don't have peace trouble and fear you will live perpetually Trouble over nothing and fear.
people are dying, your heart is palpitating. There are many people today who have died because of lack of peace than actual sickness. Are we together? Especially as you grow older, somehow Satan has programmed this system such that the older you grow, you lose touch of genuine peace. And so you can see young people roam around because they are largely in ignorance. But you see old people sit down and they fear everything. Someone will just sit down and carry a, a BP monitor and see that your BP has gone to the roof. Why is it going there? I just feel like somebody is about to die. This one is not like God is giving you an information. It's just the devil playing with your mind. Peace. Someone say peace. peace. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Philippians 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it says it shall keep your heart and mind, keep your spirit and keep your thinking through Jesus Christ. The troubles in this world are many. And let me tell you, if you don't have the peace of God, the devil does not need to kill you. By yourself, you will find out that you can go and fall down in a well and die. So, the rate of suicide has increased. Are we together? Increase in school fees. Increase in everything. Increase in fare, gas price, travel fee whatever it is and when you think about this sometimes you look at your children running around you look at everything you look at your relatives and you find out you are the only one taking care of 22 people and then the little money you have an arm robber meets you at the atm and says remove everything quietly and give it to me at the end of it you can go and sit down at home and literally have high blood pressure and die there are many people today not just an african thing i tell you do you know that the world today is full of sad people and people cannot they can't smile they can't rejoice what happened they say i don't know the devil is just after my life they may be right but anger does not drive him your sadness and frowning your face does not drive him why are you like this i've noticed that people don't like me he first started from my village but now he's everywhere someone say peace You must learn to have the peace of God. If you are in ministry, let me give you an honest counsel. If you don't have peace, you may not let, live long. Hallelujah. Bills, rent, criticisms, all kinds of things. If you don't have peace, you will not sleep. You will literally die from worry and lack of sleep. Then your children now come. Then your spouse now come. Then all the troubles in society. They promise you an appointment. They call you the night before and say, get ready. Put all your files together. Just be watching NTA or, or um, what's it, all the other channels. And you watch from morning till night only to see in, in the newspaper they are congratulating someone else. And they say at the 11th hour, they change your name. And you will sit down there and say, so this last one that was supposed to be a manifestation of God's faithfulness. This is how my life will be. Let me go and take poison. Or let me get a rope and hang myself. I have always wondered how people hang themselves. The pain of hanging yourself. You don't need to, you don't need experience. You just need intelligence. And yet people still do it. Let me tell you the truth. If you've never gone through certain things in life, you will not understand the value of peace. There are, if, if money could on its own buy peace, many rich people will not die. This thing called peace. When God gives you peace, embrace it and receive it, protect it. It's better to throw away your documents and carry peace in order of priority. Hallelujah. Peace. You measure my blood pressure today, you think they gave birth to me last week. I tell you, to the glory of God. This is God's ministry. I am his property, not even just his vessel. His whole property, everything. Find peace. I'm speaking to someone. I know that the rent is due, but find peace. Did you hear what I said? I know your son is not performing well in school, but find peace. I know the ministry does not have support. Things are happening. Find peace. 
I know your marriage is having some issues. Find peace. Find peace first. When you find peace, a solution can come. Do you know one thing I like about that woman? Even though she had spent her money on physicians, she had every right to be angry. You do not see any display of anger or rage or emotions. No. For a woman who has been 12 years in trouble, she had every right to be angry with anybody. If it was that woman, she would have insulted some of them and said, get out of the way. You guys don't have the issue of blood. You have no idea what I'm going through. Clear the way for me. Let Jesus heal me before he attends to your nonsense. The way she was able to stay calm and rejoice, I believe it was one of the keys that helped her to touch Jesus. And it was one of the things she got more of after she touched him. Let me charge you. Place your hand on your chest and speak peace to yourself. Say myself, find peace. One more time, say myself, find peace. You may not understand what you are doing, but you just place your hand. Say myself, find peace. That waking up in the night that is already killing you. You are 21 years old and everybody is asking you if you are 40. You are tired of explaining to people that I'm not that old. They say, so why are you like this? Lack of peace. Peace has added almost 20 years to your life. Return that 20 years to the peace and say, I'm a young person. I will grow gradually. I can't be having the stress of an old man at 25, at 30, at 40, 45. My grandfather is awake. My father is awake. Me too, I'm awake. I will be still and know you are God. My soul be still and know you are God. Yes, I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you. Sing it one more time. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still. Let me give you an honest advice, a fatherly advice, a prophetic advice, an apostolic advice, a friendly advice. If you let the problems in this life, bar, they will send you to your grave and life will still continue. Did you hear what I said? There are times you need to look at the storms and just say, do your worst. Get a chair and sit quietly. Did you hear what I said? Because life has a way of bullying you. And when Satan sees that you are threatened by life, he will magnify things beyond their proportion and surround you with it. There are young people who talk to themselves now as, as if they have a brain problem. Till they drive by themselves to a ditch, you will see a young man discussing on his own. He's looking at you. His hand is calculating this thing. 5 plus 7, 18. And you are watching him from a distance. This guy was not born that way. Life for you. I'm speaking to everybody here, especially dear brothers. Let me tell you the truth. Don't I know that it's good to be responsible? Do your best. But while you are driving, as the rent issues slap you on your face, as the bills slap you on your face and as people are passing comments and saying you are not irresponsible, don't worry. You didn't send your, your son to school. He's owing two years in some um, college or university, one state. You, have, you don't have... Let me tell you the truth. Make up your mind and hear me. Find peace. You can't pay the rent of the ministry, the auditorium. You are in trouble. Are you going to pack up the church? The elders in you, in, will come and meet you and say, did God call you? I'm not saying you are fake, but were you called? And you know, human beings know how to add, we call it in Africa, adding pepper and um, adding uh, whatever it is. It looks like this one that you've been, you've not been, your mother and father have not been happy. Are you sure that you didn't offend God? That's what they told Job. And Job said, ah, 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 don't be hasty. I will be still. Listen, let me tell you this. Hold on before we sing. I was teaching at the uh, uh, workers' retreat and I was sharing with them some of the things 
that we've gone through in our little lives. I'm a young man, no? But there's a way life will give you gray hair because of the things you've gone through. Did you hear what I said? I've lived many lives in my life. Many lives. There is nothing that is as bad as his looks. Provided you can sleep and wake up, believe me, storms will pass. Just trust me when I'm talking. Ministry storms, marital storms, financial storms, as they are coming, be waving them because there is a law. There is a law. It passes with time. Passes with time. Meaning you are crying today, but you will soon laugh. You will soon rejoice. Meaning you don't have a child today, but begin to rejoice. Because all those clothes you bought will not be in vain. Living children will wear all of them. Are we together? Yeah. That garage you have seen in your mind will not remain empty. One day an honorable car will be inside. Yes, sir. There are things you need to know about storms and challenges in life. Honestly, they come, they have an ability to bully you. Like they will not pass, but they will pass. What has Nigeria not gone through? Hey, it's Nigerians. What have we not gone through? Are you still alive? Are you still strong? Did you still celebrate your birthday? You think you will not celebrate another one? It will come and pass. Believe me. Believe me. Believe me. What has your company not gone through? What has your ministry not gone through? What has whatever it is? Remember, I remember those days when we were owing money from our crusades. If you ever told me these days will come, I will believe by faith, but they look far. Here are the days. One day we'll be in a building of our own and we'll forget that there was ever anything like building project. It will come to pass. You will not be a tenant forever. Just know that. Apostle, but as I'm speaking now, my landlord has even sent me a text in church. Don't worry. Your landlord is not, a, he's not, he's not an angel. He's a human being. No matter what happens, it will come out of it. Did you hear what I said? I will be still and know you are God. My soul be still and know you are God. I just felt like ministering this to someone, particularly to people who are going through health and financial storms. These two storms. These storms, ba, they don't have anybody as a partner when you are going through it. There may be people around you, but these storms are so personal. You will stay there, and that boat is rocking with you alone there, and you have to believe God. But I'm telling you this, you will come out of it. Amen. You will come out of it. You will come out of it. Hallelujah. So the clear, unmistakable evidence when a man touches God is one, reverence and honor. Two, superior proof producing wisdom. Three, liberty in all its ramifications. Four, genuine power, access to life transforming power. Five, peace. Now, for a final session, I want us to answer the question, who touched me? Because it was a question Jesus asked. We cannot end tonight's teaching without answering that question. What kind and what manner of man is able to touch God? Who touched me? Meaning not everybody can touch me. So let's see very quickly from the lens of scripture. What kind and what manner of man is able to touch God? Such that it produces a destiny altering effect. Are you ready? Number one, the first kind of man who can touch God according to scripture is a man with a broken and a contrite heart. Please write it, we'll rush. A man with a broken and a contrite heart is the only kind of man who can touch God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4 to 6. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 to 6. It says, and such trust have we through Christ to God word, uh -huh. 
not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency, the Bible says, our capability, our ability to always rise to the occasion is of God. Verse 6, who hath made us, we didn't make ourselves, we were made by God, able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Psalm 51 and 17, we looked at that earlier on. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. Is someone learning? Psalm 100 and verse 3, very profound, simple but powerful scripture. One day God opened my eyes to see that scripture. 103, Psalm 100 verse 3. 100 verse 3 media help us a hundred and verse 3 thank you it says know ye that the lord is god and that he it is he that had made us and not we ourselves for we are his people and the sheep of his pasture until now every time i read that scripture i would just focus on enter his gates with thanksgiving come before him with singing but verse 3 tells us a very profound information he says have this knowledge as you come before god that it is, he is the one who made us and not that we made ourselves can i tell you a life of pride and boasting will alienate men from touching god the kind of man who can touch god make contact create a response of empathy compassion from god to reach down to that man for his destiny is the man with a broken and a contrite heart number two what kind of man is able to touch god are you ready a man who perpetually acknowledges and honors god a man who perpetually acknowledges and honors God. This is the kind of man who can touch God. Who touched me? A man, that includes woman, who perpetually acknowledges and honors God. 1 Samuel 2.30 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30 Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed, that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. Is that in your Bible? And they that despise me, disregard me, trivialize me in the affairs of their lives, carry me as a necessary luggage, I will lightly esteem. God loves everybody but he does not treat everybody at the same level. You settle that. He loves everybody sincerely, but when it has to do with trust and his dealings with men, he does not deal with everybody at the same level. Second to a broken and a contrite heart. Let me explain to you. I feel like backing, backing down just to explain to you what a broken heart is. You know what a broken heart is? I wrote something here. A heart that is ever aware of your insufficiency outside the help and the mercy of God. This is what it means to have a broken heart. I'll take it again. A heart that is ever aware of your insufficiency outside of the help and the mercy of God. That's what it means to be broken. To be broken does not just mean to be wounded. That, that's, not, that's not what I'm, I'm talking about. A heart that is ever aware I'm backing up to the first point so that I'll just give clarity to it. Let me tell you the truth. One of the secrets, and I tell you this with all humility, if you ever ask the secret or one of the major secrets behind the hand of God upon this ministry, it is because I have come to a point where I know that if God does not help me by myself, I'm not able to do much for the kingdom. I've weighed myself spiritually, intellectually, financially, are we together? Sociologically, removing God. And I found that I do not weigh much. Very small, pastor. Very small. It's difficult for leaders to admit this because we think that, you know, the more invincible you present yourself, 
the more it is that you'll be respected. It's not true. Human beings are more intelligent than that. Are we together? I am ever aware if I run koinonia with my brain, I will run all of you inside a ditch. We will not even reach six months because there is a way that cement right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Are we together now? You use brain work alone to do the things of the kingdom, you would derail yourself and derail God's people. Hallelujah. When I go to God in prayer, I don't go bragging and boasting and say I'm that great man. No. I go before the Lord sincerely and I'm saying it, you are here listening to me. I cry before him and I say, Lord, thank you for your mercy. I am what I am because of who you are. Koinonia is what it is because of your mercy. If you take your hand and you take your mercy from my life, it says, if the Lord had not been on our side. Are you seeing that now? There are many things that we have gotten beyond our prayer life. There are many things that we have gotten beyond our fasting life. There are many things we have gotten. The favors, the mercies. For the things you have done. For the battles you have won. Only you are worthy of my praise. I magnify your name. For the things you have done. And the battles you have won Only you are worthy of my praise I magnify your name The finances to run this ministry The wisdom to run this ministry The spirit of revelation to see something worth preaching about in this Bible Withdraw that wisdom from the spirit and you'll be surprised You will open your Bible and not find anything you will search from morning till night. Everything you see that comes from this life, bringing God glory. I tell you, my dear family here, a global family and as many who are following, this man you see, huh? my only stake in that equation is receiving the mercy of God and partnering with him by grace. Even the grace to be diligent came from God. So where then is our boasting? This is not a declaration of weakness. You run your mouth and you boast around God, takes one step out of your life and you become a lesson for the nations that men without God cannot go far. We magnify your name. We glorify your name. We magnify your name. We glorify because in this kingdom, the race is not to the swift. The race is not to the swift. I've seen brilliant people. I've seen gifted people. I've seen skilled people. I've seen anointed people. I've seen families that love God with all their heart. Yet death kept coming to pick them one by one. In spite of the fact that they were righteous, loving people. And yet there's someone smoking out his destiny somewhere. And that guy will not die. A car will hit him, he will still recover. Different things will happen. He will smoke himself to passing out. And yet he will wake up and clean himself. No morning prayer, no afternoon prayer, no night prayer. And yet there are sincere believers who have died. When you add this equation called life bar, the end, the most constant factor is God. Every other thing is not worth creating as a template. Not you, not your ability. Everything will eventually fail. This is my understanding. When I cry before God and I lie and roll before God, I tell him, Lord, I'm doing this sincerely. This is your ministry. These are the, your people, the sheep of your pasture. I've seen very anointed and great men of God who cannot command the attention of a generation. Nobody's interested in hearing them. I've seen people who have signs and wonders, miracles, prophecy at a rate and a scale and a level you cannot imagine. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. There are billionaires in this country and around the world who have never seen the wall of a classroom. You sit down with them, they cannot even coordinate the kind of logic that brings that kind of financial results. But some of them were in their childlike faith open before God. And they said, Lord, if you will empower me, I will bless the nations. And there are smart people, after they are done talking with all that intelligence, they will ask you for transport back to their house. Hmm. 
Listen, let me teach you something, my dear people. One of the signature traits in this ministry is humility of heart and a recognition that God is the factor, the absolute factor behind anything good that comes from your life. Never be embarrassed to let the nations know that without him you do not amount to much. It is only foolish people who would think that is a disregard of your reputation. Those who know God and those who have lived long enough in life will know you are not lying. Are we together? Let's go to number two. Let me hurry up. Who touched me? What kind of man is able to touch God? A man who perpetually acknowledges and honors God. Trust in the Lord, the Bible says in Proverbs 3 from verse 5 and 6. With all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Verse 6 says in all your ways, acknowledge publicly. Acknowledge him. I was speaking not too long with one of the fathers of faith in this nation. And he told me, he said, Apostle, my advice for you is always acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge him before your people. Acknowledge him in the secret. He kept pounding it and he was telling me. He said, always don't fall into the trap of trying to receive glory to yourself. Always. And I said, yes, sir. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. He said, it's a very simple but deep secret that you let men see that God is behind everything. And God says, you did this for me? Get ready for the next level. And mysteriously, you may not look like it. You will not even add up. Yet the results never stop. God for you. Are we, are we learning now? Number three, very quickly. What kind of a man can touch God? A man who chooses to walk and live by faith. Who touched me? What kind of a man can touch God? A man who chooses as an act of your will that you will walk and you will live by faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. The Bible says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must come believing that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Genesis 15 and verse 6. I like this. Genesis 15 and verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it unto him for righteousness. Those who believe God. The, that woman you see, she did not just come to a celebrity. She did not just come to a Jewish Messiah. She knew that this one had the power to heal me and I believe it. And she reached to the helm of his garment and virtue flowed. You can be around the things of God and never believe that God is able to lift you. You can be around a powerful anointed house like this and not believe in the God of that house that he's able to lift you, bless you, change your story. You can shout amen and still not believe. You can even fall down and stand up and still not believe. Those who touch the heart of God those who touch the hand of God, those who can contact the power of God, are men and women who choose to walk and live by faith. Say, I choose. Shout it as loud as you can. Say, I choose to walk by faith. Say it again. I choose to live by faith. What does it mean to live by faith? To live in obedience to God's word. To live in obedience to God's principles. Whatever he says to do, do it. Don't be too intelligent for God. You need to mechanically argue because he has carried the foolish things of this world, you see. When you walk with God, sometimes you will become so childlike in your operation. But in that simplicity of heart, you will produce extraordinary results. A man, a woman, a ministry, a business, a home, a nation, that chooses to walk and to live by faith is a nation that can touch God. Number four, the statement who touched me, it means what kind of man is able to touch God? What kind of man is able to create that spiritual impression that compels God to reach down to you for the profiting of your destiny? Are you ready? 
a man with a heart of genuine gratitude I tell you the kinds of people who can touch God a man or a woman with a heart of or a genuine heart of gratitude Psalm 69 30 to 32 very interesting scripture I will praise the name of the Lord with a song and I will magnify him with thanksgiving this also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs the humble shall see this and be glad and your heart shall live that seek God in that manner you see to praise him with a song back to verse 30 and to magnify him with thanksgiving for the things you have done and the battles you have won only you are worthy of my praise let me give you one minute and I hope I'm not wasting your time mention at least two things that from January till now God has done in your life and I want you to tell him thank you in a very lavish intentional way go ahead two things there are many things but I want you to choose two things Zaria UK Canada Koinonia Global go ahead ah. and the battles you have won only you are worthy of my praise for provision thank you for wisdom thank you for results for the miracle services for koinonia for safety living in the morning and returning back in the night thank you That someone had a dream that you died by January and this is April you are still alive and the dream was not a lie it was a desire of Satan for your life and yet you escaped death someone tell him thank you thank you for finances changing my story changing my levels in the spirit multiplying your hand upon my life In Jesus name we pray live a life of gratitude ever grateful you are walking home father I give you praise thank you you tell him thank you in your language thank you in English thank him in every other language you know and while you are telling him thank you the devil will tell you but he has not done this and that and that and you thank him lavishly very quickly number five what kind of man is able to touch God for the profiting of your destiny for the profiting of your life are you ready one who is willing to not just receive but to be a blessing one who is willing to not just receive but to be a blessing one who is willing to not just receive but to be a blessing give us Luke chapter 8 go to verse 46 please very quickly Jesus said somebody had touched me for I perceived that virtue is gone out of me 47 watch this and when the woman saw that she was not hid the Bible says she came trembling and falling down before him the Bible would have stopped there but she went further the Bible says she declared unto him before all the people she allowed her story to be a testimony to let other people know that God is able to do this in your life because she saw that all those people who were touching Jesus they wanted all kinds of solutions but they did not know how to get it now that she had gotten the result she was not selfish she used her life declaring openly this is what he did all of you are trying to look for money but here is the path God led me to I can share with you you are trying to look for healing I suffered stage 4 cancer and I was about to die God save me I will not be silent this is the path I followed are we together 
I was about to be thrown out of my house somewhere in Abuja here. But I prayed a certain kind of prayer and God came through. Can I share it with you? Those who touch the heart of God are those who have as a covenant within their heart a desire to be blessings with their lives. Write this down. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So all the families of the earth will be blessed, but they will be blessed in thee and through thee. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and 4, a scripture that has blessed me for many years. I'd like us to read it together. Write and then please read. Ready? One to read. Who comforted us in all our tribulations? Uh-huh that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we ourselves are comforted by God. That means when God comforts you, when he comes through for you, he expects that you must know that someone somewhere around the globe is also suffering what you have suffered. You lost a loved one and God granted you grace to come out of it. There is a testimony out of your pain, out of your victories. There is a testimony out of your scars and out of your crown that can be a blessing to someone. Let me tell you the truth. Many believers are selfish. It is the reason why they are not able to touch God. What did you do that brought you the anointing? What did you do that brought you genuine kingdom prosperity? What did you do that took your ministry to a global scale? What did you do that announced your business to the nations? How did you maneuver through the limitations around your life? You can comfort others with the same comfort. The woman who had almost lost her destiny and was at the well, she dropped her fetcher and everything there, ran to the city and said, all of you come. The four lepers, remember the mistake they were about to make? They wanted to eat everything alone. And they said, no, we are not kind enough. We are lepers and this abundance is for a nation. Our entire lifetime will not be able to exhaust this. Let us send word to Samaria that there is good news and that everybody can be a beneficiary of it. Let me tell you the truth. One of the ways I know as far as receiving multiplied grace is concerned, is serve the one you have with all your heart. If God has given you 10 naira, let someone benefit one or two naira from it and that 10 naira will not stop. That was the secret that kept the woman, the widow of Zarephath. She had just her jar of water and then the morsel of flour and the prophet came to teach her something, not just to receive a miracle. He said, let me tell you how things remain from what you have serve the purposes of God with it and you will never experience complete depletion. It's true. Hallelujah. From what you have. One day from that your one room you can cook one pot of rice and put it in little packs and give two or three people and tell them this may not be much. It may not even be the kind of thing you want to eat but this is with love from me. This is Jesus extending his hand. And God says, you could do this with one pot. So I will do something for you and bring you to a point where you can serve the nations. This is how we started by the grace of God. We didn't wait until we had the power to raise people from wheelchairs. If the one you have is headache, do it with honor. Don't go somewhere and say people from wheelchairs stand up. You will be embarrassed except if you just want to struggle your way. You can start from where you are. You don't have the power to heal, but you can speak to someone and bring inner healing. Go ahead. Use produces increase. Use produces increase. Efficient use produces increase. Hallelujah. Use produces increase. What kind of man can touch the heart of God? The man who is willing to be a blessing using your victories using your testimonies using your scars using your crowns using your victory stories to bless your world and ultimately to help people know jesus like we say love jesus and serve him if you have vowed that everything god does in your life 
will only lead to you being a blessing and will help you to make many know Jesus, love Jesus, and serve him. I tell you, you, have, you will touch the hand of God in a way that will surprise you. Every prayer I pray as touching God, giving me anything or bringing any kind of increase to my life. God is my witness. I always connect my desires to kingdom come. This is the reason why I'm asking you to give koinonia this, oh God. This is the reason why I'm asking you to bring this to my life. The honor of receiving this, receiving that. Let it be for your glory. Let it be for your name. Let souls be saved because of it. If you add 10 naira to my life, let it be the reason why somebody will not cry. Let it be the reason why somebody will be able to pay his rent. Let it be the reason why someone's daughter will not die in sickness. If you add one level of the anointing, let it be the reason why oppression will end in the life of someone. If you send me to this region and that region, you see, when your life no longer becomes about you, you have found the key to touching him. Do you know the woman would have kept quiet knowing she was healed? She would have slipped herself away. There are lessons we never would be able to learn. But she came declaring, I'm the one you have shown mercy. You have shown me mercy. You have shown me mercy. That's what she did before Jesus. That I'm the one you have shown mercy. You have shown me mercy. You have shown me mercy. One. You have shown me favor. You have shown me favor. You have shown me favor. I'm the one who say, I'm the one. You have shown me favor. You have shown me favor. You have shown me favor. You didn't work for the car, but somebody drove that car to your house and gave you the key. Don't brag. Let someone know Jesus because of that car. Are we together? Yes. You see, the reason why we give testimonies here, unfortunately, in church now, testimonies are just beginning to be a show. I'm hoping that God will restore generally testimonies to be a platform that shares the goodness of God. Are we together? Let me encourage you, when you come to share testimony, I know many people give, as you share this testimony, come with a broken and a contrite heart. This is what God has done. He gave me one billion. Don't joke with me, you have rubbish the testimony. We are supposed to see Jesus through the testimony, not you. If the whole focus is on you, you've lost the testimony. I was about to die. And God came through for me. And somebody through your testimony can see the healer stretching his hands to him. Now that is truly a testimony. Are we together now? M maybe a man of God came and is sitting somewhere across the overflow. And whilst you are sharing, the man is wondering, can ministry ever work for me like this? And then you just remind him that one time ministry did not work for you too. Suddenly that becomes his message. Always hide behind the cross and let men see Jesus. This marketing of self is what makes good things to still destroy people when it comes from us. There is a way you can talk about money that does not become a blessing again. It is clear you are boasting. There is a way you talk about anointing. There is a way you can talk about prayer, about fasting, about the word, about increase. There is a way you can talk about excellence in business. People no longer see Jesus. It becomes clear you are marketing yourself. Learn this. You alone will not God, and I surrender. Oh, you alone not God, and I surrender. You will not go down if you let people see Jesus rather than yourself. It is impossible to focus on Jesus and they forget about you. I tell you, you try this. I've seen very wealthy people, billionaires. You talk with them, they tell you their story, they leave you more spiritual than even a businessman. Because in their story, you can see how selfless they are. You know that they are completely detached to their money. I don't want people to come 
for koinonia and see a celebrity man of God. No, that would be an insult to your time, insult to your destiny. That behind the frailty of this man you see, you will see the risen Christ moving through the lips and the hands and the gestures of this man that you look beyond the speakings to the heart. You want to touch the hand of God? You want to touch God? Hide behind the cross. All this marketing of self, I am a this, I throw all of that away. You alone are God and I surrender. When God sees that everything about your life will reflect him, he will give you money beyond what you think you can handle. Believe me, he will give, you will see power, grace, influence. Again, I refer you to something God told me years ago. Son, if you will let men see me, there is nothing I will not give you. That is one of my covenants with God. To let men see him, that I may decrease, that he will increase. And my goodness, what a good deal. I'm happy I was foolish enough to make that deal. And thankfully, by his grace, that that will continue. Some of you here who are in ministry, let me give you a kind word of advice. The temptation to always want to be known, to project yourself, is a weakness in people. But let me give you a kind advice. Learn to hide behind the cross and let men see you. After they see the power, the display of wisdom, the intelligence, the creativity, perhaps for a businessman, after they see the versatility in knowledge, when all is said and done, and people are tempted to begin to worship you, remind them, like the apostles who tore their clothes, I'm only human. The excellency of power is of God. There is nothing a man can receive except that which is given to him from heaven. Let me give you my final thoughts and then we'll wrap up on this meeting. I've given you five descriptions of the kind of man who can touch God. A man with a broken and a contrite heart. A man who perpetually acknowledges and honors God. A man who chooses to walk and to live by faith. A man with a heart of gratitude, genuine gratitude. And finally, one who is willing to use everything that flows from God to you to be a blessing to the nations. But I want to wrap up by giving you one angle to this. Who touched me can also be that men can touch God in a way that leads to their destruction. Hmm. Who touched me can be a statement of empathy and love. But who touched me can be a statement of anger, even from God. There is only one kind of person who can touch God that way. Many tried to touch God that way and they saw a side of him that was not good. Pharaoh tried to touch him that way. Nebuchadnezzar tried to touch him that way. Darius tried to touch him that way. Herod in the New Testament tried to touch him that way. Even Paul as Saul tried to touch him that way. There is a way a man tries to touch God that becomes a downplay of his power, his grace, his wisdom. I wrote something down here. The kind of man who can touch God in a way that leads to his destruction is one who perpetually fights the advancement of God's kingdom. A man who with his life, with his words, with his whatever it is, his resources, any man who tries to perpetually fight the advancement of God's program is touching God in a way that he will receive a response that is not of kindness or empathy but of judgment. Exodus chapter 5, 1 to 3. I needed to bring this angle so that you will learn. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may go and hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Verse 2. Hear what Pharaoh said. Who is this Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Verse 3. And they said, 
the man you are playing with is the God of the Hebrews that met with us let us go is a warning we pray thee three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword can I tell you ladies and gentlemen men can touch God or attempts to touch God by touching the advancement or the continuity of his program by touching the vessels that enhance his program and the Bible is very clear as to the fact that when men touch God that way he reacts in a way that can be very dangerous let me give you a final scripture Matthew chapter 21 this scripture blessed me profoundly 12 to 15 two kinds of people touch God at once 12 Matthew 21 12 to 15 watch this and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple these people touched him by doing something to his house that brought him anger and pain the Bible says he went there he didn't comfort them and advise them he overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves next verse the Bible says and he said unto them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves or robbers the next group another group came immediately the blind and the lame came to him in the same temple they touched him and he healed them two expressions of his touch within the same scripture you can touch God to attract his power to attract his empathy to attract his compassion using the principles I have shown you or you can make up your mind that my life will be an interruption to God's program and you can touch God in a way that may make him respond sometimes it will be a destiny altering way to the negative men died because they touched God wrongly kings died because they arrogantly made certain declarations kings were turned to beasts for years and made to sojourn the earth the bushes of the earth because they attempted to touch God let me tell you the truth it is a dangerous thing to fall into the hand of the Lord as much as the Lord is merciful and compassionate I can tell you that when men rise up to become perpetual interruptions to his program after he exhausts his mercy on them he can arise in vengeance and arise in power and arise in anger he says let God arise and let all his enemies be scattered and I've taught you here who God's enemy is that God's enemy is not a man you don't like or a woman you don't like God's enemy is anyone any people any persons any institutions that perpetually become an interruption to God's kingdom come program everyone who interrupted the flow of the gospel interrupted the power of God from reaching people they receive sometimes fierce judgments from God so we will not end the teaching who touched me just by showing the compassionate loving and wonderful side of God there is a way men can touch God there is a way men can mock those who love God there is a way men can mock those who serve God there is a way men can mock those who live for Jesus there is a way men can mock people who love him and spearhead the gospel across missionaries and all kinds of people you see that you may not know that you are touching him in a way that will create a response and it will destroy you my prayer for you is that you will only touch God in a way that leads to your lifting that you will only touch God in a way that leads to your rising that you will only touch God in a way that will cause the nations to see him revealed through your life that you will touch him in and through your worship you will touch him in and through your preaching you will touch him in and through your giving you will touch him in and through your brokenness and contriteness of heart you will touch him in and through your walking and living by faith you believe that I want you to rise up on your feet and begin to pray that in the name of Jesus like the woman with the issue of blood I make up my mind that from today my heart is open for destiny altering encounters someone pray go ahead from the depth of your heart begin to pray someone is praying who touched me a revelation of what happens to men when they touch God when they reach 
when they come in contact with when they connect to producing feelings of affection and empathy and sympathy causing him to reach down to their destinies administering to them his power administering to them his wisdom are you praying administering to them his favor administering to them liberty administering to them peace that surpasses all understanding who touched me may it be that joshua selman is the man who has touched him may it be that koinonia is the ministry that has touched him may it be that your family is the family that would have touched him for i perceive that virtue i perceive that glory i perceive that favor i perceive that the power to liberate i perceive that the power to heal i perceive that the power to raise men i perceive that the power to change a man's destiny for good has come out from me pray one last prayer father may everything you bring to my life be used for your glory may everything everything i will do your will do your will do your will oh God. are you praying i will do your will do your will do your one more time. I will do your will. Do your will. Do your will, oh God. No matter whatever may come my way, I'll follow, I'll follow. to me be used for your glory to reveal you to the nations to reveal your power to reveal your wisdom to reveal your grace to reveal your love to reveal your wisdom one more time That's how it works in the kingdom. When all of you becomes about all of him, his glory, his life, his power, then you are willing to see God in another dimension. I'm wrapping up and I want you to listen to me. I said that last week and let me repeat myself as I wrap up. It was not part of Jesus' schedule to heal Darius' daughter, nor the woman with the issue of blood. There was no prophecy that had gone ahead of her that healing was coming she was in every way disadvantaged jesus was on his way to honor a centurion's request who said his daughter was at the verge of dying and in honor to such a man he was on his way one of the synoptic accounts will tell us and while she was going a woman by her hunger by her sincerity frail having bled for years lost money lost life lost her health of course you can imagine that beauty and color would have been lost too yet she reached only god knows what all the things she told herself is just one of the things that the bible lets us know that she said to herself meaning there were many other things she said to herself the bible just gives us access to one of them if i may but touch the helm of his garment i will be healed maybe she also said and if i'm healed because that statement does not sound complete. If I touch the hem of his garment, I may be healed. Perhaps, I'm just thinking aloud. Maybe she said, I, if I'm healed, I will make sure the nations know that he is the healer. I will make sure the nations know that he's the lifter. I will make sure the nations know that an outcast, an unclean woman, culturally so, can become one who will spearhead 
the campaign of raising his name I vowed with my life that in life and in death my singular purpose and assignment will be to reveal Jesus to the nations with everything that I have everything that I am and with all that I can have as resources within me this is how to touch the hand of God translate all that desire and weave it to your prayer your prayer now becomes powerful translate all these thoughts weave it to your fasting your fasting now becomes potent translate all these thoughts weave it to your Bible study your Bible study becomes potent translate all that thoughts weave it to your church attendance your commitment to ministry every other thing suddenly lines up and finds its value because you corrected your understanding I want you to leave service tonight as you go home knowing that men can touch God and that they can touch God in a way that defines their destiny that empowers them with such grace and glory they are transformed and from their transformed selves they can reach out to the nations lift your hands and give God thanks for what you've heard tonight we honor you oh God for bringing us word in season we know that man can touch you. The great, majestic, even mysterious God can be touched by mortal men. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I taught you while I was teaching that the first way to touch a man is to find proximity to that man. It is almost impossible to touch a man from afar. You will need to come close. Close enough to make contact. There are people here you have been far from God because you have never everyone stand never truly made a decision for Jesus you've heard preachers talk about this Jesus you've heard songs about this Jesus you've attended services that talk a lot about this Jesus perhaps you've read books that talk about this Jesus and the Lord sent you to church tonight and whilst listening to me here in Zaria across the globe the Lord began to speak to you that when he makes an altar call run come Jesus is looking for you that woman would have kept quiet and she would have lost her miracle. You can choose to go back without giving Jesus a chance to change your life. But I'm only calling on one person right now who is saying, I'm not playing games again. I am ready for Jesus and ready indeed. Leave your seat as I count one to five. Young, old, male, female, everywhere across the globe and on site here. I count one to five. Please, I'd like you to leave as fast as you can. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait for anybody to lead the way. Make your way here in the name of Jesus Christ. Come. Koinonia, let's celebrate them. Many are coming to Jesus. One. There are things only God can do. Two. Apostle, I want to come, but I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. You can be free tonight. You can know you are free tonight. Remember I told you when men touch God, they find liberty. It says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Then it says, I will give you rest. Come. Are you clapping, Koinonia? Four. Your clapping is also a sacrifice. One final count and I begin to pray. Please, if you're coming, make your way very quickly. All the overflows and outside, you can move to your projector screen outside and just wait there. Thank you. Thank you for the bold step to come. Scripture declares that as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. Thank you, Koinonia. Let me lead them in prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making this bold decision for Jesus. I love you and we appreciate your boldness. This is family for you. Please lift your right hand. That includes those across all our expressions. Lift your right hand. Even if you are in your room, watching by television, watching in your car with your device, or even if it's a rebroadcast, lift your right hand as a sign of surrender to this Jesus and say this as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus, I declare that I love you with all my heart. I have heard your word tonight. I desire to touch you. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, 
hell and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight, I'm a changed person. I go forward ever and backward never. Amen. Keep your beautiful hands lifted as I lead you to pray. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus. I pray for this, my precious people. Scripture declares that as many who will come to you, you will in no wise cast away. You have brought these ones even by your spirit. Let your grace keep them. Empower them to live victorious lives. In the name of Jesus. And everything that will not let you serve God, I command it to live your life now. I declare that you will serve God in truth and that you will go forward ever and backward never. I bless you and I decree that from tonight and forever, you are a child of God. Amen, amen and amen. Now you will notice our, our counselors waving their placard just at my right. That will be your left. May I please request that all of you in concert, you just move this way and they will have a word with you very quickly and then you are back to your seats. Thank you very much. Thank you for cooperating with us. Let's celebrate them, Koinonia, this way, all of you. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning. I have learned to walk in your ways. For step by step, you lead me. And I will follow you all of my day. Let me speak over your life. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Shout a believing amen. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. May the lines fall for you in pleasant places. I place a mark of favor upon your head. I place a mark of honor upon your head. Destroyers are far from your destiny. Wasters are far from your destiny. Your enemies will keep seeing you rise. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare that favor meets with you this week. Breakthrough meets with you this week. In the name of Jesus, the grace for prayer is evidently upon you. The grace for the study of the word is evidently upon you. Your life will reflect that of a believer. Good news for you this week. I say it again, good news for you this week. Coming from every quarter, national and international. In the name of Jesus, your help has arrived speedily. Your help has arrived speedily. The ears of your helpers are open to hear your cry. In the name of Jesus, you are blessed in the city. You are blessed in the country. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Together, let's share the grace in fellowship. Make sure you invite everyone you can invite to join us for next week. It will be another powerful session in the presence of God. Let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen.